Okay, picking it back up. So now we want to talk about the Association of Realtors offer to purchase and contract, that 2T form that I passed out. And what I'm going to do is I will kind of go back and forth between the slides and I will also have it up here on the screen so I can kind of point things out at the same time as well. So as I said earlier, with this contract, what was the primary motivating factor when they wrote this contract? What were they trying to avoid? What did I say they were trying to get rid of? Get rid of all contingencies. And this contract gets rid of all contingencies, but it doesn't do it by making things worse for the buyer. You know, because generally speaking, you would need contingencies to protect who? The buyer. In case something doesn't happen, because obviously the buyer might not get a loan. The buyer, the property might not appraise. The, the, the buyer might find something on their inspections. There are legitimate reasons why the buyer might not want to move forward with this transaction. So when I say that we wrote this contract to get rid of the contingencies, I don't mean that they tried to take advantage of the buyer. What they actually did was made it straightforward and just plain old said, the buyer can get out, period. And that's why you don't need any contingencies. What is a contingency? The right to do what? The right to get out. Guess what? In this contract, the buyer has the right to get out. And it specifically says they have the right to get out for what? Any reason whatsoever. So look at this. I want you. I want to show you this in the contract. If you look at the offer to purchase and contract, I'm going to get it pulled up here, and I'll tell you what page to go to. If you go over to page, I believe it's page four. Actually, page five. So it's in paragraph four on page five, just above paragraph five. It's like subparagraph F. Everybody see where I am? Buyer's right to terminate right there. Everybody with me? Buyer's right to terminate. It says the buyer shall have the right to terminate this contract. For what reason? Any reason or no reason. Folks. Why would you need a contingency? Because remember, remind me, what is a contingency? It's a way for the buyer to do what? Get out. Get out. Well, we just gave them the right to do what? Get out. Get out for any reason. It says the buyer can terminate this contract for any reason or no reason at all by delivering to the seller written notice of the termination during the due diligence period, time being of the essence. What do we say that phrase, time being of the essence, means? It means it's a firm deadline. Now look at the last sentence in that paragraph. It says, if buyer timely delivers the termination notice, this contract shall be terminated and earnest money deposit shall be what? Refunded, Refunded to the buyer. What do you think timely is? Timely is going to be during that due diligence period. Does that make sense so far for everybody? So right there, you just learned the most important aspect of this contract. The buyer has the right to do what? Terminate, but only for a certain period of time. What period of time do we call that? We call that the due diligence period. And if the buyer terminates during the due diligence period, they will get what back? Their earnest money deposit. Is everybody good on those things that we've put together so far? Now here's what you need to know about that. Nothing changes that. It is straightforward, it is clean, it is clear. The buyer has the right to terminate this contract during the due diligence period for any reason, or no reason at all. And if they do it during the due diligence period, they're gonna get a refund of their what? Of their earnest money. Yes ma'am. That's not a crazy question at all. In fact, that should be the, say that question again. 
when is the how long is this due diligence period because is, is it going to be an important time period clearly yeah. absolutely it's going to be an important that's not a crazy question that's the question i would ask about like, how the hell long is this thing because if you think about it that's a big deal we just said the buyer's got the right to do what just walk away and get their earnest money back is everybody with me on that so we need to figure out how long that's going to be for that we have to go back up to page two if you go back up to the page two at the bottom of the page some paragraph j down there you see the blank it says due diligence period and there's a blank in there it says the period beginning on the effective date effective date is the day we go under contract so the due diligence period starts when as soon as we go under contract and it continues through 5 p.m. on and you're going to fill in the blank so that means it's a negotiable date right and what does it say about that date time being of the essence so that means this is an absolute drop dead deadline what it means is that the buyer has the right to terminate this contract for any reason but they have to do it by when the due diligence expiration is everybody with me on that so this is a negotiable time period now i'm building you up and then we'll talk about how long it should be okay so kind of hold on to your question because i know i didn't really answer your question all i've told you right now is it's a negotiable time period well let me ask you the obvious answer how long of a due diligence period does the seller want the shortest possible if i'm a seller i want zero days i want right now because i don't want the buyer to have the right to do what to cancel if i'm the buyer how long do i want a long time all the way to closing closing would be a wonderful due diligence expiration that means i could terminate all the way up to the closing table right the truth is the negotiation is going to be somewhere in the middle correct everybody good on that so now let's talk about why that date is so important well we made it clear that they have the right to terminate up to that date it's possible though that they go past that date and they still don't close is that possible it's possible to go past that date that's called a what what do we call that fancy contract word when you don't do what you promised to do a breach it's not a breach if they decide not to buy during the due diligence period because the contract says they have the right to decide not to buy during the due diligence period does that make sense it is a breach if they go past the due diligence day and they still want to get out of the contract are you following me with this thing so now i want you to scroll up it's also on page two but it's a little bit further up earnest money deposit everybody see where i am it's a longish paragraph but i want you to listen to this and i'm going to edit it down because a lot of the language is repetitive because it's legal language the earnest money deposit paid in connection with this transaction shall be deposited and held in escrow means where in a trust account by the escrow agent and if you look down just below this paragraph there's a blank there for you to fill in who the escrow agent is right so you choose who's going to hold the earnest money does everybody see that okay so it's going to be held by the escrow agent until closing at which time it will be credited to the buyer so there's a big question about the contract if we go to closing does the buyer get credit for their earnest money deposit yes. yes so it's part of the purchase price it's not in addition to they get credit for having already paid that money does that make sense to everybody so it says if, until we go to closing at which time it will be credited to the buyer or until this contract is otherwise terminated is everybody following me so far okay it says if the offer is not accepted then obviously we're going to give the earnest money back to the buyer but it's the next sentence that i want to pay attention to in the event of breach of this contract by the seller what does it say is everybody with me so far in the event of a breach of this contract by the seller the earnest money deposit shall be refunded to buyer upon buyer's request but such return shall not affect any other remedies what are remedies fixes, fixes or damages it shall not affect any other remedies available to buyer for such a breach what does that sentence say it says if the seller breaches the buyer is going to get their earnest money back 
and the and the buyer can still do what? Sue. sue. That's what that sentence means. The, set, the buyer can still sue. All right, I'm continuing on. In the event of breach of this contract by the buyer, does everybody see where I'm at? No. It's the next sentence. Still in this paragraph right here, right? We, oh, in the event of breach yes. by the seller, okay? In the event of breach by the buyer. It's the middle of that paragraph. Does everybody see where I am? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You need to highlight this sentence. In the event of a breach of this contract by the buyer, and tell me what a breach would be before we even go any further in the sentence. What is a breach by the buyer? Not close, but it's more than that. It's not closing after a particular date. Not closing when? After due diligence. Because can they walk away before due diligence? Yes, it's not a breach unless they back out after due diligence. So, in the event of a breach of this contract by the buyer, the earnest money deposit shall be paid to the seller as what? liquidated damages and as the seller's sole and exclusive remedy for such a breach. What does that mean? This cannot sue for more. That the only thing the seller gets if the buyer breaches this contract is what? The earnest money deposit. That's it. That's all. Because remember, that's what liquidated damages means. It means the two parties have agreed in advance on an amount. Does that make sense to everybody? So from the seller's perspective, is the earnest money deposit an important amount of money? Yes. yes, because here's the way you should view the earnest money deposit as a seller. What if on the day of closing, the buyer backed out? You better make sure that that earnest money deposit is enough money to make that okay with you. Are you following me on that? Because could they back out on the day of closing? Yes, yes, which would be a breach. And you would get to keep what? The earnest money, but you've also agreed that you would not what? Sue, Sue them, so you better be satisfied with that amount. You accept the low earnest money deposit if you want to, but you're placing yourself at severe risk that that buyer just goes, hmm, what, so what if the earnest money is $500? Not good. Does the, seller, does the buyer care about $500 most likely? No. He'll call you and say, hey, we changed our mind. And, and the seller's like, well, you can't do that. And the buyer's like, sure I can. I'll forfeit my what? My earnest money. So that's how this contract works. Put it all together. The buyer has the right to terminate up to a certain date. What date is that? The due diligence date. If they terminate by the due diligence date, what do they get back? Now I'll say everything. Their earnest money. Their earnest money, right? If they terminate for any reason after the due diligence date, what happens to the earnest money? They lose it and forfeit it to the seller. So the most accurate way to describe the due diligence date would be to say that the due diligence date is the date that the earnest money goes from what to what? buyer to seller or how about from refundable to non-refundable the due diligence date is the date that the earnest money goes from fully refundable to fully non-refundable that's what changes at five o'clock so at 4 59 p.m on the due diligence day the earnest money is what refundable at 501 it is what non-refundable does that make sense for everybody? That is how clean this contract is. You don't have contingencies to worry about and dates to worry about. What you've got is one date that matters. The due diligence date. That's it. And that's all. Now, let's talk about the time period again. The due diligence time period. Come back to your question. If you're the buyer what do you need to make sure you're comfortable with by the due diligence expiration? Inspection, appraisal, financing. You need to be pretty much be 100% sure you're ready to do what? Close. Close. Move forward. Does that make sense? 
Because if you don't, for any reason, because here's what's going to happen. You're going to have some whiny buyer. Don't be this agent with this whiny buyer. <laughs> we didn't get our loan. And? Well, we want our earnest money back. No. <laughs> Why? Because it's not my fault you didn't ask for what? Enough time. Remember, that's a blank line where it says due diligence date, right? So, to go back to how much time, you can't come up with that number on your own. Who do you need to be talking to before you make this offer on behalf of your buyer client? The lender. You need to be talking to the lender and say, how long is it going to take you to get final loan approval? Because shouldn't you have final loan approval during the due diligence period? Do you need to be talking to the home inspector to make sure you can get a home inspection done in plenty of time during the due diligence period? Do you need to be talking to the appraiser to make sure that the appraisal can be done in plenty of time during the due diligence period? All that communication should happen before even do what? Make the offer. Because you should know how much time your buyer needs to get their ducks in a row. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Don't guess. That's where brokers put their clients in a bad position. Now, oh, we'll just do 20 days. And they haven't even talked to the loan officer. And then they get under contract and they start trying to call the loan officer and find out they're in Cozumel for 10 days. Do we have a problem? Uh-huh. Yes, ma'am. So is it smart for agents to have a agent before they go Well, you can get a pre-qualification. An approval you really can't get. Now, you can get approval on the borrower, but remember an approval also involves the property because you've got to have appraisal done and all that sort of thing. So you still, but yes. The more you can have that front loaded, the shorter you can make this due diligence time frame. And think about that. Is that valuable to be able to offer with a shorter due diligence time frame? Mm -hmm. In a market where sellers are getting multiple offers, aren't they going to be looking for the due diligence time that is the what? Shortest. The shortest. That's going to be one of the things the seller is going to be considering when they're evaluating these offers. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes, sir. Is there a percentage cap on that? Absolutely. Yes, there is a percentage cap. A hundred percent. That's the maximum you can do as one of these numbers. A hundred percent of the purchase price. So anything between zero and a hundred percent is fair game. Yes, ma'am. like a standard percent or dollar? See, we can't talk about things like standards and that sort of thing. What is the average? Well, there's not. That's the, that's the thing. Because it's such an ultra-competitive, I mean, and I'm not even trying to dodge your question. There really isn't. We're in such an ultra-competitive market that these numbers are flying daily through the roof. Or, you know, and, and it's pockets of numbers. So here, so, so let's talk about, hold that question. Well, because since we just sold our house, I yep. just remember the, the person that had the higher due diligence and the higher um, earnest money, that looked like they were more serious. Right. Well, so hold that thought, because remember, you're one step ahead of your classmates. We haven't even talked about a due diligence fee yet. See, in your brain, you're already ahead of them. So hold. that's what I'm saying. Hold on a second. We've only talked about what so far? Earnest money and the period of time. What we haven't talked about is, what does the buyer have? To, would you agree that the due diligence period is very valuable to the buyer? A period of time when they can back out and get their earnest money back. That's valuable. If I'm the buyer, that sounds great to me. Does that make sense? They got to pay for it. They got to pay for that period of time. Yes, ma'am. So you can't Nothing. Date. Yours says what? Where? But, I mean, where? On the line for the due diligence period? So, look, I won't... <laughs> what is her I, I, I'm just going to read to you what your contract says. The due diligence period, the period beginning on the effective date and extending through 5 p.m. on new construction, time being of the essence with regard to said date. Now, what kind of moron does somebody have to be to draft something like that? A moron. 
Because it doesn't even make sense. Like if you read that sentence to somebody, you'd be like, dude, that doesn't even, that does not even have subject verb agreement. It says with regard to said date. New construction is not a what? Date. date. So what you've got is a contract that's probably not enforceable. Most likely. Except the way that works most of the time in North Carolina is that a court of law won't hold the other party responsible for you making that change. They'll hold you responsible. So what they'll do is construe it in the worst possible terms for you. So what they would probably tell you is you don't have a due diligence period. Which means your earnest money is what? Non-refundable. Non-refundable. Because that's what the effect of... Because I've seen these come in with N.A. Not applicable. Well, what does that mean? It just means you don't have a what? A due diligence period. Everybody with me on that? Now, this thing, this period of time is valuable. So go back up to page one. On page one, the money section is front and center. Now the first line is self-explanatory. That is the purchase price. Okay? The purchase price. Notice it says paid in what? U.S. dollars. Bitcoin is not U.S. dollars. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, can we buy a house with Bitcoin? The answer, of course, is yes, if the buyer is willing to accept it. But you can't use what? This contract. Because this contract specifies that the property will be paid for in what? U.S. dollars. Bitcoin is a currency, folks. It is not U.S. dollars. So you would not be able to use this contract. Okay? The second line, what does it say there that the second line is for? The due diligence fee. Now let's talk about that word, fee. Look at the next line. Earnest money what? Deposit. Now they weren't just trying to intentional, to just, they weren't just randomly using separate words. Those words have a purpose. A, an earnest money deposit, could it potentially be refundable? Is this one refundable? Yes, for a certain amount of time. An earnest money deposit is refundable when? During what period of time? Due diligence period. And non-refundable when? After the due diligence period. So that word deposit means it could potentially be what? Refundable. What do you think the word fee means? Non-refundable. Look at that line. It says, blank by due diligence fee made payable and delivered to seller by the effective date. This is an amount of money that's paid by the buyer directly to who? The seller on what day? The effective day. The effective day. The effective day, folks, is the day we go under contract. This amount of money is due the instant we go under contract. Bless you. The instant we go under contract. The very second we go under contract, this amount of money is due. Does that make sense for everybody? What do you think you're paying for? Why is it non-refundable? What are you buying? You're, not, you're buying time. You're paying for the due diligence period. You're buying that period of time. Because just like I asked this question, does that period of time have value to the buyer? And you all said what? Yes. yes. Does that period of time also have value to the seller? Yes. yes, except it's lost value. Because what did they had to do? Take their house what? Off the market. They've put it under contract to you. They can't market it and sell it to somebody else because it's under contract with you. Could that potentially harm them if you end up not buying their house? Absolutely, and that's why you're paying them for the time. Now notice there's no number filled in here for you. It means it's what? Negotiable. Completely negotiable. Now, now I'll come around to your question. Average number, standard number. Yes, ma'am. Um, when Leslie was here, I think she said that they had a friend that went under contract and paid $14,000 Due diligence I have seen due diligence fees of $20,000. Think about that for a second. That's a non-refundable check 
payable to who? To the seller the instant we do what? Go under contract. Now, 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 let's think for a second about what the buyer bought. What they buy? Time. Man, that's an expensive time. Time that they can do what? Time that allows them to do what? To back out. Now, think about this. It would have to be something pretty dang bad to back out after you've paid fourteen thousand dollars in non-refundable money, wouldn't it? And so that's what you need to consider about the due diligence fee. The larger this number is, the less power the buyer has. Because, put yourself in the seller's position. If they've written you a check for $14,000, and they do an inspection, and they come in and they say, listen, the HVAC system is blown up and needs to be replaced. We want you to fix it or we're going to walk away. The seller will literally fall on the floor laughing in your face. Because if you do walk away, they're going to keep what? Your $14,000 due diligence fee, spend seven of it on a new HVAC system, spend the other seven on a vacation, and then do what? Sell a house to somebody else and say, by the way, we got a brand new HVAC system. They're not going to tell the buyer that some other buyer paid for it, but they're going to do that. Is that are y'all following me on that? Now, I, I got you, you don't have to, I'll come. So, the other side of that is with a really low due diligence fee. Let's say a due diligence fee of $100. Who has all the power? The buyer does. Because the seller has essentially pulled their house off the market for nothing. And the buyer can walk away and the seller gets to keep what? 100 bucks. Now, the reality is, there are places in the state where you will find hundred dollar due diligence fees. There are places in the state where you'll find zero dollar due diligence fees. But they're not here in Raleigh. They're not here in Raleigh. I bought mine with one hundred uh three years ago. That's three years ago, darling. Three years ago. May as well be three millennia ago in real estate terms. Okay. You need to understand, real estate markets move day by day. What was the price point on the house? Uh, 106. Where is it located? Um, near Triangle Mall. All right. So it would be more like $2,000 right now. To even have your offer considered. Why? Well, you're the seller. It's your house. Would you accept a $100 due diligence fee right now? Oh, it's amazing how that changed, ain't it? <laughs> So mate, what changed? The house didn't change. What changed? The market. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because right now there's what? There's less property that's available. Less property than people, right? More buyers and houses for them to buy. What are they doing? They're competing. And what's one of the major ways that you think they compete with each other? The due diligence fee. That of course they compete on sales price, but they also compete on due diligence fee. When you were evaluating offers, was that a consideration of yours? Absolutely. Absolutely, because the buyer who brings the bigger due diligence fee, you feel is much more serious, right? And another way of saying much more serious is much less likely to do what? Back out. To back out. Because they got way more tied up in this thing. Does that make, is everybody following me on that? So let, me, so let me show you what I mean. As a seller, you may very well see two offers that look like this. You got offer number one that's got a purchase price of $250,000 with a due diligence fee of $3,500 and an earnest money deposit of $5,000 and we've got an, a due diligence period of, let's say it expires on August 30th. And offer two comes in at 255 with a due diligence fee of $1,000, earnest money deposit of $1,500, and a due diligence period that ends September 30th. 
Closing date's the same on both of them. Talk to me. You're the seller. In fact, you're the listing broker and you're advising the seller. Which offer do I advise they accept? Let's assume this is the best we can squeeze out. We've already countered, we've been back and forth. Which one is the better offer? Better offer. Because you are more likely that this will close at 250 than that that one will close at 255. And here's why. They pay you that thousand dollar due diligence fee and you pulled your house off the market till when? September 30th. On September 25th, they come up to you and they say, by the way, the heat exchanger's cracked. We just had our inspection done. We want a brand new HVAC system. So here are your options as a seller. You can, of course, say no. And they're going to do what? They're going to walk away and you'll keep their how much? Thousand dollars. And you have to put the house back on the market. And now you're going to be much delayed in closing, right? And you have to now disclose to subsequent buyers that the heat exchanger is what? Cracked, because that's a material fact. You follow me on that? So, with those options, what's the seller likely to do? Let all that happen or replace the HVAC system? Replace the HVAC system because you feel like you're over a barrel and you got no, are you following me on that? Because, and here's the thing, the HVAC system costs $7,500. 255 just became 247.5. You, you see where I'm going? Same transaction, same house, same inspection. Comes back, crack heat exchanger, we want you to replace it. What do you say? No. Because not only have they paid you $3,500, so they're much less likely to walk away, they've informed you of it a full month sooner. So it's not nearly as costly for you to, if they do walk away, because you can do what? Put it right back on the market and probably find a buyer that's still going to close on the same time frame, time frame they were. Does that make sense? So when you tell them no, what are they most likely to do? Close anyway. So you end up closing at 250, which has actually ended up better than the two. See, that's the kind of thing you get from being in the market, from being in this business a long time. I can see that coming. I can see it coming. And, what I, and the reason I can see it coming is because I recognize who has the power in the negotiation on the right and who has the power in the negotiation on the left. See, if I'm on the seller side, I'd much rather be here. Yeah, of course we'd love to get $5,000 more money. The problem is, experience tells me we won't. Experience tells me we'll end up with a seller that feels cornered and they have to cave and they end up with less money. Yes, ma'am. So the due diligence fee is paid to the seller, so they do not have to split that with the listing agent. Correct. Paid directly to the seller. Yes, Seller's money. But their earnest money is, does have to be split with the listing agent. According to, if they've used the realtor's exclusive right to sell listing agreement, it does say that. Yeah, that's what the real, realtor's exclusive right to sell listing says. So is everybody good on this so far? All right, so let's go back through the time frames again. Due diligence fee, refundable or non-refundable? Non-refundable, non paid by who? Buyer. By the buyer, to who? Seller, Seller. when? As soon as we go under contract, okay? Earnest money deposit, refundable or non-refundable? Refundable for a time, right? Refundable up to when? Due diligence expiration, non-refundable when? After. After. Does it matter what the reasons are? No. No, it is just cut and dried clean. Do you see how that's much easier to deal with than 46,000 contingencies? Yes. It's a very clean contract. Yes, ma'am. But it just seems like the buyer is still getting worse than that. Why does it seem that way? Because, I mean, we know that they can get out of it for mm -hmm. any reason. Yep. But at the same 
same time, if they do choose to get out of it because they have a little children, mm -hmm. they get ate up by the two children. No, they're not. Come buy a house in Edgecombe County. Buy a house in Edgecombe County, they can pay a fifty dollar due diligence fee. I guarantee you. So who gets who gets abused there? The seller does, because you got a buyer dragging you around by the nose, and they walk away, and you keep what fifty bucks. See, your problem is that you think somehow there should be some sort of inherent fairness in contracts, but they don't work that way. This is what kind of a market right here? Who dominates this market right here, right now? Sellers. Sellers. you got to know that if you're a buyer and you want to get in the game. That's as simple as it is. If you want to get in the game right here in this market in most price points in the, in the triangle, you need to know that as a buyer you're going to get taken advantage of. And if you don't want to be taken advantage of, either sit it out and wait right now or move out the country somewhere where there's not as much competition. And see, I don't say that to be cold, but that's the kind of advice a buyer's agent needs to be given to a buyer. Because what you don't need to have a buyer believe is that they can get the best of both worlds right now, because they can't. But guess what? It'll come back around. Who do you think was crying the blues in 2010? It wasn't the buyers. It was the sellers. Because back then, these due diligence fees were 100 bucks, $50. And he used to hear, every, and, and the same people would be sitting in the classes going, this is so unfair to these sellers. <laughs> this is the most ridiculous contract ever for these sellers. And now they're going, this is so ridiculous for these buyers. And they don't even recognize that it's not the contract, it's the market that dictates it, right? This is a seller's market right now. Yes, ma'am. So is there, okay, I know it's a contract, but I know, I'm probably going to answer, but you know what if? Like, since you're getting multiple offers and they go through and it's appraised for like way less than. And? Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, they said, how's 250 better appraised at 220? Who is they say? Who is they and how do they say it? Well, yeah, what's that got to do with anything? There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, what should a buyer be very comfortable about when they make an offer price? that it will appraise for that number. So does that mean that the buyer and their agent should do some research about comps and what it would appraise for before they make their offer? Absolutely. Because this contract, I mean, you have to think of it this way. The contract gives you the biggest possible protection, which is you have the right to do what? Walk away. So make sure that you get enough time to figure that out. That's really what it boils down to. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so due diligence date, what changes? What changes about the contract on the due diligence date? Earnest money goes from refundable to non-refundable. Good, good, I think you're getting it. See, once you get it in your brain, it's really not that complex of a contract, right? It's a fairly simple idea. And it's meant to be simple, it really is. Now, I want you to look at this language at the bottom of the page. I want you to highlight this because it'll probably show up as a test question. One of the major points of contention that happens in the Real Estate Commission, I always get phone calls about this and complaints about this sort of thing, is what happens if the buyer hasn't paid money that they owe? Primarily, what money would they owe that they may not have paid? Due diligence fee or what? Earnest money. And a lot of real estate brokers don't understand that they're not judges. We got real estate brokers out there that will say, you haven't paid your due diligence fee yet, so we don't have a contract. No, 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 no. We have a contract the moment we have communication of what? Acceptance. You don't get to decide that we don't have a contract just because you think somebody hasn't paid money they owe. As a matter of fact, the contract tells you exactly what to do in that case. What does it say to do? If the buyer hasn't paid money that they owe, what should, they, what should the seller do? Give them, one more day. give them one more day. It says give them written notice and then provide them with one banking day to replace the funds. Did everybody see that? So if the buyer does not pay any money by its due date, 
that the seller will make written demand for the money and they will have to give the buyer one banking day to provide the funds. Now what does it say you can do if they don't provide the funds within one banking day? You can terminate it, move on with your life, and sell it to somebody else. That makes sense for everybody? Okay? So you need to know that for a test. Yes. So in our local MLS, Generally speaking, they use contingent to indicate that it's during the due diligence period and pending to indicate that it's after the due diligence period. That, I'm not, that's not to say that's really correct necessarily, but that's kind of the convention in our local MLS. So, so if you see something marked contingent, that probably means it's during the due diligence period. If you see it marked pending, that means it's outside of the due diligence period. So it's gone past due diligence at that point in our MLS, in the triangle MLS. As far as the escrow agent down on page two, notice you can fill in the name of the escrow agent. I'm going to tell you who's the most likely escrow agent, the listing firm. The listing firm is the most likely escrow agent. What would be the second most likely, do you think? The closing attorney would be the second most likely. Could it be the buyer's firm? Sure, it can be anybody they agree to on this line. But most likely, listing firm, second most likely, closing attorney. I actually prefer the closing attorney route. Page two. Page two. Everybody good so far? Okay. So I'm going to skip over things that you will not be tested on. It doesn't mean they're not important. It just means you will pay more attention to them once you're actually with a firm and they'll go over it with you line by line. But I want to make sure we focus on the things you need to know. At the bottom of page two is the settlement date. Now we normally call this the closing date. There's a slight difference between settlement date and closing date. Settlement date is the date we meet and sign the documents. When is the closing? When the documents are what? recorded. Ideally, those are the same day. Could they be different days? Yes. Yeah, especially if you have the settlement meeting late in the afternoon and the courthouse is closed before you can get the documents recorded, closing may not happen until the next business day. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So, but fill in the settlement date there. Notice what phrase does not, well, let me point out one thing. Look at the end of that sentence. At a time and place designated by who? The buyer. the buyer. If you're on the seller side, get over yourself. This is not your show. I have I, that. That drives me nuts in a transaction. Well, that doesn't work for me. I'm sorry, precious. I don't really care. Because the contract says closing is going to happen at a time and place decided by who? The buyer. Because here's the truth: the seller doesn't even have to be there. They can do all their stuff ahead of time. There's realistically no reason for them to be there. It's the buyer doing all the work at closing, and since they're bringing the money, we kind of let them call the shots. That, uh, I think that's kind of fair, right? What phrase does not show up after the date here in this blank? Time being of the essence. I want you to make a note in here. I'll point it out to you where the paragraph is, but I'm going to let you put the note right here by the closing date. Not only, and, and so I just hold off, and I'll tell you what the note is going to be in a second, but I want to explain it to you. Not only does this thing not say time is of the essence, there's a later paragraph in here called the right to delay or delay in closing paragraph. And what it actually says is that either party, so buyer or seller, has a right to a 14-day delay period under this contract. So if they have missed this settlement date, they aren't technically in breach until they've missed it by at least how many days? 14. 14 days. Is that something you should explain to your clients when you talk to them about a closing date? Yes. yes. Because if they got all their stuff piled up in a truck to move in and the seller decides that they can't close on that day and they're going to close five days later, somebody's going to be upset. And the seller is well within their rights to do that because this contract, if you've used this contract, says that you have a 14-day right of delay. 
Everybody okay with that so far? Settlement and closing date, same thing. There's no separate date on here. Closing is going to be when the documents are recorded. Okay? Over on page three, you've got your fixture section. Remember, I said the first place you always look to determine if something's a fixture is where? In the contract itself. Does this contract list a lot of things that are going to be considered fixtures? Yes. Yes. So if it lists them as a fixture, what are they? Fixtures. They're fixtures. If they're not listed, then what are you going to do? You, you, well, if they're not listed, you're going to apply the test. You're going to ask, is it permanently attached and was it attached by the owner of the property? If it meets that criteria, then it's a fixture. Does that make sense? Now, over on the next page, why would you be listing fixtures? Look on the next page, on top of page four, where it says, other items that do not convey. The following items shall not convey. So you would only list fixtures that you wanted to what? Right. To exclude, to take out. Because fixtures normally what? Right. Convey with the property. Fixtures normally convey with the property, so you would only list them if you wanted to exclude them. But personal property is the opposite. Personal property normally does what? It, 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 it stays the property of the seller, correct? So if you wanted the personal property to be conveyed with the home, what would you do with it here? List it. Notice it says it will be conveyed at no value. At no value. Right, so you just include it as personal property. There you go. Um, paragraph 4 just explains the buyer's due diligence process and things that uh, the buyer should have done. It's basically just advice to the buyer to have all this stuff done. But I do want you to look over at page 5. There's a very important statement. Paragraph C on page 5. I'll give you a second to get there. It says, it's right under this box. The box is blue on my screen. It'll be black on yours. It says repair, improvement, slash negotiations. Does everybody see where I am? This is my major concern with your contract. That new construction contract. What state was the house in when you signed this contract? Was it finished? Mm -hmm. Buyer acknowledges and understands that unless the parties agree otherwise, the property is being sold in its current condition. Do you mean to buy it in its current condition? I'd be worried about that if I were you. So, because of that statement, would you say this is an appropriate con and this is actually a test question. Is this an appropriate contract to use for new construction? No, no it is not. It is absolutely not. Matter of fact, there's a special version for new construction that doesn't have these kinds of statements in it. What are we saying here? The property's being sold what? As is. As is. That's what it's saying. Buyer, you're buying the thing as is. Now, can they negotiate for repairs? Yes, but we're telling you up front the expectation is that you're buying it as it sits today. Two kinds of property you would not want to use this for. Vacant land and new construction. Vacant land. Any resale residential this works for. Condos, fine. Townhouses, fine. Single family homes, fine. As long as they're residential and resales. So, no vacant land, no new construction on this contract. Alright, continue scrolling down. We've had this question before. If you look in the middle of page five, there are toward the bottom actually. Right above paragraph five, in bold, it says closing shall constitute acceptance of the property in what? It's then existing condition. So if you're not satisfied with something, don't what? Don't close. Because if you close, the law, this contract just said that you had accepted the property as it was. So if you have some concern that something hasn't been done, the seller was supposed to do, what's your best recourse? Don't what? 
don't close. Because once you close, that's it. We all okay there? That is on page five, just above paragraph five. Thank you. Okay. Did everybody see that? Good. All right. Uh, keep scrolling over on page six, top of page six. Remember in chapter 8 when we talked about the residential property disclosure statement? Remind me about that form. Who fills it out? Seller. And they give it to who? Buyer. Before the buyer does what? Makes an offer. And if they don't give it to the buyer before the buyer makes an offer, the buyer gets what? Three days to do what? To cancel any contract. That's what these questions are about. Look at the options. It says the buyer has received a signed copy of the property disclosure statement or the buyer has what? Has not received a signed copy of the residential property disclosure statement. Then it goes on to describe the three-day cancellation period. Does that make sense for everybody? I want to point out the third option. We talked about this a little bit, but I want to point out Remember we said, not every property is subject to the Residential Property Disclosure Act, that there are some exemptions. You need to know those exemptions. What, what properties did we say were exempt from the Residential Property Disclosure Act? Foreclosures, estate sales, and new construction. Those are the three big exemptions. So if it was one of those three, you would check exempt and fill in the reason it was exempt. Foreclosures, new construction, and estate sales. Basically, attorneys selling stuff for trust funds or estates would all be exempt. Okay, everybody good? All right, you can scroll on down. And over on page 7, there's a place to list contact information for the Homeowners Association. I don't think you'd be tested on that, but you'd want to list the association's contact information, what the dues are, all that good stuff. Um, over on page 8, there's a statement in there about what kind of deed the seller will provide. Look at paragraph G on page 8. Good title, legal access. What does it say? Seller shall execute and deliver a what? A general warranty deed for the property. Paragraph H, just below that, that's where you're going to list how the property is going to be titled. Keep in mind that how it's going to be titled includes the form of ownership if there's more than one owner. What are the different forms of ownership there could be if there's more than one purchaser? Tenancy by the entirety, tenancy in common, or joint tenancy. That should be indicated on this line. Ideally, you should indicate how they are taking title. Well, if they're married, what can you just say? You don't have to say it's tenants by the entirety. You can just say what? Married, or husband and wife, or a married couple, or however you want to state that. However you want to state it, if you indicate marital status there, they're going to know that means tenancy by the entirety. If they're single, though, you've got to indicate it's tenancy in common or what? Joint tenancy. And if you say joint tenancy, you should also say with the right of what? Survivorship. Because the only reason you'd be asking for joint tenancy is if you meant to include the right of survivorship. So, like, for example, if you have two people, you know, John Smith and Mary Thomas as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. That's the way you would write it out. We have to know the way that we would write it out? You have to know the way you would write it out? Yeah. No. For the text you mean? Right. No. But you better know what joint tenancy with the right of survivorship is. Yes. Okay. Is everybody good on that? Now, what do you do if somebody asks you, how should I take title? Should we be joint tenants or should we be tenants in common? What do you say to them? Talk to an attorney. Talk to an attorney. You may know. 
you may have a good idea of what the answer is, but just send them to an attorney. Okay? Don't give title advice. Yes, ma'am. Because those complaint cats out. What did you say when you was putting the married all that? Were you at H? What yes. H. That's how the deed's going to be made. I just below it, the seller paid closing costs. How many of you have ever heard of seller paid closing costs? Okay. Yeah. This is when the seller agrees to pay some amount of money toward the buyer's closing costs. You do this to try to help the buyer not have to spend as much cash because if you pay some of their closing costs, then they are in essence financing more of the purchase. Does that make sense? Because normally you, the buyer would have to pay their closing costs out of pocket. Keep in mind that the seller doesn't really care about what number's on this line because mentally all the seller is going to do is subtract this number from what number? From the purchase price. If you offer $255,000 but you're asking for $5,000 in seller paid closing costs, how's the seller going to look at that offer? $250,000. For them, it's just a straight deduction because you're paying them two fifty five, dollars but they're handing you $5,000 back to pay your closing costs. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. a pre-understood, like, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,000, $250,
and one of them is asking you for five thousand in seller paid closing costs, and the other one are all clean offers, not asking. Would that be a red flag about that buyer? Yeah. Yes, because here's what it tells me about that buyer: they ain't got no money. Because the only reason you ask the seller to pay your closing costs is if you what? You don't have them. You can't afford them. That's why you ask for it. Does that make sense? Okay. So that would be something you'd have to weigh out. Um, that is it. Um, well, I'm telling you, yes, ma'am. Then they were very, very open to paying buyers closing costs and minimizing the cost for buyers to get in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, paragraph 9 over on page 9. This just points out the things that are going to be prorated between the two parties. There are three things that you need to worry about prorating, and we're going to have to do this math later in the class when we get to closing statement math, learning how to prorate things. What does it mean to prorate something? Discount. How about split it up, right? Think about property taxes. If we sold a house today on August, what is it, the 14th? On August 14th. Does the seller owe property taxes for this year? Yes. yes. Since what day? Since January 1, right? Does the buy, is the buyer going to owe some property taxes? Yes. yes. Here's the thing. The county is not going to deal with splitting it up for you. The county wants one check. And who's most likely going to write that check? Not right now. Too early in the year. What hasn't come out yet? The bill's not available yet. So who's most likely going to write that check? The buyer is. Because when the bill comes out, it's going to be the buyer who owns that property. And the buyer's going to pay the whole thing. So what do you think we're going to have to do on the closing statement? Figure out how much the seller owes and do what with it? Give it to the buyer. So that the buyer's got it. So when the bill comes due, it's already been taken care of. Does that make sense? Okay? That's how we would prorate property taxes. So three things that we prorate on a closing statement. Property taxes, rent, and homeowners association dues. Because remember, if the property is leased, the tenants come with the property, right? And so the rent has to get split up as well. So property taxes, rent, and homeowners association dues would all be prorated at the closing. Paragraph 13 is the delay paragraph that I told you about earlier. So, how long do we say they have? 14 days. 14 days. It takes them eight lines of text to say that, by the way. Over on the top of page 10, you might want to just draw a big box around this addenda section here. We're not going to go through each one of these addenda. What's an addendum? What do you think it does? Change is not the right word. It does change. It adds. It adds to a contract. An amendment would be a change in a contract. An amendment you do after the fact, an addendum you do in the beginning. So there would be certain circumstances that this contract doesn't have quite enough oomph. It doesn't have quite enough information. It doesn't cover the situation. Like, for example, if, say, um, this were a new construction property, could we make this contract acceptable for use with new construction? Yes. By doing what? Yes. By including the new construction addendum. I bet the new construction addendum would say something like that whole paragraph that says we're buying the property in its current condition. We were just kidding about all that, right? See what I mean? If you were for example, making an offer on a property that was already under contract and you wanted your offer to be considered or accepted as a backup contract, what addendum would you maybe include here? The backup contract addendum. If you as the buyer wanted to make it clear that you had to sell your current property first before you would go through with this sale, what one of these addenda would you include? A contingent sale addendum. See, they're pretty self-explanatory what they're used for, right? Okay. 
just that if you add that addendum to it, it's not there unless you do what? Unless you add it. Unless you add it. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So just make sure you know that there are some standard addenda and, and they're used for different things. The names are pretty self-explanatory. Are these the only ones that's listed? These are the only standard ones. So if you could not find what you were looking for in this list, what do you think you would have to do? Have an attorney draft an addenda specially for your use in the transaction. That's what it says. You check that. Box. And that's why you would check that box and notify. It doesn't say identify other addenda. It says identify other what? Attorney, attorney drafted addenda. And you would put the attorney's name right there. Well, you would put the name of the addendum there. You would put whatever the attorney named the addenda okay. right there. No, because generally speaking, if I've got a buyer client that says, well, I want an addendum that says this, I say, okay, well, let me contact the attorney and find out how much that's going to cost us. Hey, Patrice, I talked to the attorney. He said it would be $1,500 for that addendum. What do you want me to do? What are they going to say? And don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That usually squashes that right away. Well, they'll be glad to do it for you, but it's not going to be cheap. It's not going to be cheap. It, so it's not very common at all. Okay? Everybody good? That's it. That's it for this contract. Are we good on the basics? The idea of due diligence, when stuff, when earnest money is refundable, that sort of thing. Until you get the midterm? Oh, you funny. You're funny. All right, let's take your last break. Come back at uh, 9, 10, and then we will wrap it up. We will finish up this chapter. Yes. Oh. I don't know whose glasses those are. Do you know whose they are? Yeah. Yes.